Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be interviewing a cast member from a cult movie. His name is Daniel Needon, and he was in They Still Call Me Bruce. You may remember the first movie, They Call Me Bruce, back in 1982. Well, this was They Still Call Me Bruce in 1987. He's literally the only member of the cast I've been able to to locate, <clears throat> and I'm gonna be talking to her. I'm gonna be talking to him today about um, the making of the movie. You know what happened to his career afterwards. He ended up um, becoming a well-respected acting teacher and all that stuff in New York. And I'm so intrigued to find out about it today because he was one of the funniest characters in the entire movie. And he was so comedic. I'm just w wondering why he didn't become more successful um, in the movie industry. And so, yeah, I'll be talking to him today. Um, yep, Daniel Needon is who I'll be talking to today. And I'm waiting for him to call. Hi, Daniel. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So these are funny circumstances. It was just, when I read that, I'm like, wow, that's a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Um, thank you so much for taking the time today. Um, before we uh, get into They Still Call Me Bruce, I would like to know, um, when did you know that uh, you wanted to be an actor? I grew up in Nebraska, right? And I would, you know, always be part of community theater, and it was just—it was freeing. I, I liked kind of the controlled insanity of it, I guess, and uh, and I could sing, and so you know, it was kind of a five thousand seat outdoor theater there, and I'd always be part of the musicals in the summer or stuff at school, but mostly, I mean, anything that was community and. Since there's a whole spectrum of age, uh, I ended up just knowing a lot of people in town because with community theater, there's a lot of people that, you know, have just nine to five jobs, but they're really fun and stuff. So it was, it was really neat growing up there, just kind of being a member of that weird secret society. And then from there, I went to school for it and then moved to New York in the late 70s and started working. And, uh, and then that, I don't know, it just, it was a natural place to go. Yeah, Marlon, Marlon Brando, um, Henry Fonda, yep. they're all from Nebraska, you know? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's quite the, quite the club. And, and they, in a lot of those cases, um, I think Fonda's mother was one of the teachers in Omaha, and there was, a, in, in some cases, it was just a, a family hobby or family business or something. But, yeah, it was, uh, it was neat growing up with that lore. It was good. Where'd you grow up? I grew up in San Mateo, California, which is in San Francisco, the suburbs. Right? Yeah. Huh. And also, like, were you always around entertainment stuff? Or? Um, yeah, I mean, I did, um, I mean, I was always a movie buff, and when I got to high school, I did theater, and um, some of it in my 20s, and, um, I'm pr and um, I come from, I, I did a lot of, I've done a lot of stand-up comedy in the last 12 years, too. And cool. wow. I'm pursuing the, the business finally in the last uh, few years. I had a car accident a few years ago that changed my life. Jeez, I'm sorry. Oh, it's the yeah, best. The stand-up comics have always been, uh, I've always been fascinated by the, I guess, one of, like the psychopathy of it, because the really extreme comics. I used to uh, book talent in a place called the West Bank Cafe at 42nd and 9th. It was one of my first jobs in New York. Mm -hmm. And they'd always say, like, oh, the MC didn't show up. Run two blocks over to 44th Street at the Improv and go get an MC. And the talent pool, <laughs> the talent pool that I had to cheer from was Gilbert Gottfried, um, Paul Reiser, uh, I don't know if you ever know, uh, Frank, um, what was his name, Mike Sergio, Rick Overton. 
Yep. Uh, and, and Andy Kaufman, too. I mean, the people that would come and hang at the bar and wait for their time. And you, you know how, even if you get screwed over by someone who's famous crazy, you, you tell stories about it. I, yep. For some reason, I would say to Andy Kaufman, okay, all you got to do is come over, introduce about three or four different people at the West Bank, and I'll pay you. You know, all we could really pay was like $25 and two drinks. And he'd be like, some character could be like, okay, guy, just just give me the money now and I'll be there. And, and he never showed up like three times. I just, I think I enjoyed <laughs> just getting screwed over by him because it was so funny. Oh my, it was cool. Oh my God, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I know Rick, I know Rick. I watched them develop who they were, especially Gilbert. Yeah. He just, or he worked hard. It was so cool. Oh yeah, I'm glad you're doing that. Do you, so do you do it in San Mateo or are you, where, you live in LA now or where are you? I, I live in Redding right now, which is, you know, on the way to uh, Sacramento um, huh. because of uh, some circumstances I'm in. Uh, my mother needed help uh, paying the rent, so I moved down here a year ago. But I'm planning on uh, moving to L.A. Right. But you can find stage time somewhere in that area? Um, not really, other than Sacramento. And, um, you know, I do this show in, in my bedroom as a, as a way of... Um, you know, being funny and, you know, doing something, you know, uh, without being bored. <laughs> uh-huh. That's great. Yeah. That's great. I did a documentary that I couldn't finish just because financially it was, when I really saw what it was going to take to finish it, I just stopped. But, uh, but I raised money back in 80, oh my God, late eighties maybe. And it was called Two Boo and what, you know, like the world of dirty comics and kind of what, how censorship works in the country. You know, you you could be Lenny Bruce and you're not allowed under any circumstances on the Sullivan Show, but yeah. you could also be Red Fox, the dirtiest man on the planet, and have Sanford and sign him. It was just it's an interesting thing what, you know, image, you know, and stuff. And mm -hmm. so I got Joan Rivers and Jerry Stiller and uh, Dudley Moore to go on film for me and talk about the whole thing cool experience just watching what makes them tick and how they felt about censorship and you know it was really cool so it just got to be a search to find the old comics like tubby boots and and pearl williams and, and there's very 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 little footage and when i finally found out where to get it it was a shocking amount of money per second that i couldn't afford and so i had just kind of had to stop because what's a documentary without the proof you know yeah, wow, that's unfortunate. That sounds like it would have been a good documentary. Yeah, yeah, I've got hours on each person, and I put it in the independent feature film market, the IFSM, and was offered what I had put into it by one of the fine line or one of those kind of companies, but I just thought, eh, I'm just going to hold out, and maybe one day I'll be able to get this footage, because I know where it is, and I know who's got it, but it's precious little footage, but it's the real thing. So one day maybe I'll... I'll do it and see if this thing has legs because it's certainly footage on all those people nobody's ever seen. Nice. So it's cool. Nice. Did you? Yeah. Did, did you ever move to LA? No, I came out for some some pilot seasons, and since I'm mostly in the theater, I uh, remember when the LA fires were. I can't remember the year, but I was out there at the Odyssey Theater, and we were one of the waiver nice waiver theaters, and we I was doing two shows with some of the same people in each show and there and at the time there were some people you know the folks knew from tv it was really a cool casting process and it was just two original plays from new york and uh the night that the first one opened was the la fire and so i just i'm standing out in the parking lot just kind of looking at the glow up on certain parts of the horizon going yep who's <laughs> 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 gonna come see a piece of theater when their town is burning down so yeah wow that was a brilliant failure I, I remember the L.A. earthquake. I don't remember the fires, though. Oh, God. Yeah, I, only, I was only there for one of those. I was at a studio just having to, like, go see with somebody to meet some folks. And I was in one of those rolling desk chairs, so I didn't feel a thing. But they're all looking around like, you know, like someone's done, whatever. And the whole room's kind of moving, but I was sitting still because the chair had wheeled on it. <laughs> so I'm like, <laughs> what's the big deal about earthquakes? And they're like, are you kidding? So, yeah. Wow. So, so did yeah, you... very strange. Yeah. So that's the scoop. What else? So did you have any uh, comedy uh, training at all? Because you're so comedic in the movie. Uh, well, by the time I did the movie, I'd worked up in the Catskills. And I would, since I sing, 
I would do funny songs and then intersperse those with, you know, like schmaltzy ballads. So, for instance, the, I'd open with a, a song from one of those party records called When You're In Love, The Whole World Is Jewish. And I'd sing this song about, you know, Cary Grant is Jewish and Frank Sinatra and Ronald Reagan and this and that. Every, the whole world is Jewish since I fell in love with Rosie McConnell. You know, that kind of thing? Yeah. <laughs> and um, and then I'd go from there to a ballad like, you know, some Harry Belafonte song or something from Minnie's Boys. And then uh, and in California, here I'd come in Yiddish. And then Oklahoma and he like just bizarre out of the, you know, box things. And, and, and when you're playing the Catskills, there's Stiller and Mira and there's, you know, uh, Freddie Roman or Olivia de Havilland, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, people that, you know, made, made some living up there, found different ways to do stuff. It was very cool. Mm -hmm. Did, um, right, yeah. Go ahead. So let, let me tell you my history um, with, uh, they still call me Bruce. Um, <laughs> I was five years old, at least, when the movie used, used to be on HBO, like on the afternoons in the weekends, you know, yes. when I was a kid. And... Um, me and my dad used to watch it. I didn't see it again until I was like maybe 10, and I rented it at my local video store several times. And then when I was about 20, um, I went back to my old video store, and they still, they, uh, but they had it there. And um, uh, they, they started selling all the VHSs because the, uh, the DVDs were popular. And mm -hmm. I ended up buying it. I had it until about maybe four years ago, and then I was homeless for a while, and I didn't have a place to put all my VHSs, so I had to get rid of most of them, uh, but I'm working on getting, a, like, an eBay copy of it soon, but um, it's a movie I've always loved, and how did you get so lucky to being in this movie? The guy I met in Houston, uh, Orr was his last name, the director, Jim Orr, yeah. and I started, I was, since he was starting a movie company down there <clears throat> that didn't last that long, but I think he did one other film, and I said, look, I've got some ideas, and do you have your money guys want to hear about it? He says, yeah, but I'm going to do this thing. It's a sequel to They, they Call Me Bruce, which I wasn't part of, but I'm going to do, I met Johnny Yoon, said he, said Jim, and I want to do the sequel. Do you want to write some extra material for it? I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, and I had a couple of friends that I had, been doing some theater with that were really political and socially conscious, but they were right on that same kind of level as Saturday Night Live writers. Just they could, you right. know, they could they could shoot ideas as much as anybody else, but their sense of developing them was really good. So we ended up in Houston, the three of us. I'm mm -hmm. um, on his dime. He put us up in a hotel, and you know, it was funny to us. It's like you know, you, you kind of first you want you want to have the idea that you're in some big gigantic you know Hollywood thing, but it's still it's like. <laughs> Houston, and you're working on a movie that no one, you know, you figure no one's going to see, or this or that, but Jim starts trotting people out, like Joey Travolta and Robert Guillaume, and you're like, hmm, that's kind of cool, and so we really were working, and the hardest, the biggest hurdle was Johnny Yoon, in a, in a creative way, he was a, certainly a nice, generous man, but when we come up with alternate ideas, we learned very quickly to say them to him with nobody around, and then say, would you, would you, you know, kind of uh, propose the idea to Jim for us, and that's how I, I, our ideas would get there. He wanted to really bring the stuff in himself, because he was very self-made mm -hmm. and directed and stuff, so it made sense to, like, yeah, just, you know, don't don't go past him in any way. And mm -hmm. But also, because of the way, you, you know him very well from seeing him on all those things, when, he, when you, you would say an idea to him, you know, that, you know, so-and-so yelled this right before this happened, and if it was funny, he'd just kind of give that, you know, monotone, like, that's funny. <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, okay, all right. It was cool. So pretty soon there was a this one role that wasn't quite what I had done, but he said, no, no, you should be in it because you're real frenetic and stuff, and it'll be good that, you know, I can look at that and then just kind of look toward the camera like, oh, my God, this person's irrepressible. So uh, do you remember the character name, by the way? Irving Wolitzer. There's, I'll tell you something probably nobody knows. I went to camp with a kid named Hillel. Mm -hmm. And Hillel 
had parents, one was Jewish, one was not. So his last name was Baldwin. So to get a kid, a super Jewish name of Hillel, and last name Baldwin. So I thought, hmm, Hillel, Baldwin, Irving, Wurlitzer. Like there are two pianos, a Baldwin piano and a Wurlitzer piano. Mm-hmm. And he, he's a, he's a neuro, like a neurosurgeon in Phoenix. And he never saw the movie. Like we weren't that, you know, that after you're 13 and 14 years old, you didn't see each other. So when we re-met, I showed him IMDb and or, you know just different things. I still he's never seen the movie probably to this day. But he's like, "You did what? You, <laughs> <laughs> you did a riff on my name? Like it was just inconceivable to him. It was cool." Wow. Yeah. Now, had you seen the original? Yes. Yeah. And I got it. I mean, I, it's just one. You know, Johnny was. It's like he's like a human chronology. It's like okay, this is going to make this happen, and then that, and he's he knows how to tell a story. So. You know, he was he played the other really, really well, and that's that's the thing is that if you look at certain Chaplin things or certain um, Jacques Tati or this or that, when they're the different person among everybody else, he, he, he would you, I think you'd agree he really is. He, he seems to, to do very well in that setting. His his persona did very well in that setting, don't you think? Oh yeah, he's like him and um, uh, Buster Keaton and Jacques Tati. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. I thought so. I thought they did really well that you know in, in that way, and and uh, plot was some, was not that important. Oh, you know who else was really nice? Um, uh, was it John Matuzak? Was he? You know what was the guy's name? Uh, was uh, the, uh, Donald Gibb. Wrestler? Donald Gibb. What? Say it again. Donald Gibb. Yes. Yeah. God, was he nice? He yeah. just. He, he would crack up more than anybody just how ridiculous stuff was. And they didn't put it in the film, but I said, would you do me a favor when I'm just going nuts in the ring? There's nothing for me to do except throw towels. Would you pick me up and, you know, we can fashion body slam? And we did it, and they just it just didn't make the movie. But he was, you know, like your best friend at that moment of how to do stuff because he's growling and doing, you know, and you just go along with it. And mm-hmm. even, you know, he, he'd be like, oh, one two, three, and then bang, and it just never made it in, but that was fun, to be in a wrestling ring, my God. Yeah, here's a little, here's here's a little trivia for you, um, I remember about, I don't know, ten years ago, I went on imdb.com to read reviews for the movie, and, um, J. David Moeller, just before he died, he wrote a review giving some trivia on the movie, saying that, um, uh, you guys ran out of money about about two weeks before production wrapped, and um, Johnny had to go back to Korea and beg for some more. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. I, we were, by, by the time the two weeks were there, we were all, we kind of all went down a rabbit hole, I think, where it just, what are we going to do today? Are we going to do anything today? What, and just, you know, waited, and then if there was any kind of film stuff, we'd, we were there as long as they wanted us, and we'd make stuff, some stuff up as it went along. You know, it's good stuff mostly without Johnny, like when the, oh, the Neighborhood Action Group, the Nags. Yep. And Joey was incredible at that. It was like, if you guys can keep the camera running, we'll, and, you know, he would just plot it. He was really, um, I was so impressed with him. It was so, like, that was, because I hadn't met that many people up to that point. Mm-hmm. And he knew, what, you know, every aspect of a camera, every aspect of, you know, a set and this and that, so I really took leaps from him, learned a lot from him. Of course, there was his brother, who I met when I, I think it was in a little thing at the Burt Reynolds Dinner Theater, and John was down there with some friends, so it was kind of a Travolta decade, <laughs> but he was very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I... that's great, though. I didn't... <laughs> So, uh, isn't it odd when an actor doesn't know that a production ran out of money while they were working on it? Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> he also said it was two, it was like two years before sure. anyone got paid too. Did you did you yeah. experience that? I, well, I know that since I kind of knew him before the production started, uh, I just saved him the trouble because I'd also done so much theater where you don't get paid. I'd yeah. say just give him cash. You don't have to write anything, and sometimes it was better just to get cash from him. Even, you know, with the idea that 200 bucks is better than not getting 500 bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, so I would just get cash and keep it to myself. Yeah. 
Yeah, what I love about the, what I love about the movie too is that you know Johnny is so charming as this naive guy, and mm-hmm. the original was a little bit darker and slapsticky, but this one has like real heart to it, you know. And I always felt that um, when Bruce arrives um, in Texas at the beginning. He kind of, you know, to find this man who saved his life and, and everything in Korea, I, I, I always felt that he, he's kind of going through like a midlife crisis um, when he gets there because he pretty much becomes like the Pollyanna of Houston and like he gets everything he could ask for by the end of the movie. You know, he finds the guy that, that he was looking for. Um, he gets a fiance who incidentally is a hooker with a heart of gold. And he gets a surrogate uh, son and his dream job teaching karate. Right. You know? Yeah. That's, that's no, a wonderful that's, story. That's the immigrant mentality of that movie, I'm sure, would go unnoticed. But at the time, you know, they, when, when, um, uh, when Jackie Chan started letting that stuff get in his movie and stuff, Johnny did it first, didn't he? Yep. Certainly yeah, did. that's very cool. Now that now that you bring it up, because I have not thought of it in a while, but I'm glad you brought it up. That's very cool. <laughs> My pleasure. Huh. I'm trying to think what else from Let's... the movie. I know we'd walk around wherever the set was for the in our little karate outfits, the neighborhood action thing, and oh, we, you know, with time on our hands, we would try to convince you know just regular citizens that we were really the neighborhood action group, and what can we do? And some people would be like, you know. There's someone breaking this guy's fence a couple of blocks away, and Shelly would go, we're on it, we'll be right there. You know, it's like, yeah. it was just goofy. You, you passed the time. Very cool. Let's talk about um, some members of the cast. So, Johnny, he was he was good to work with. Yes. Good. Uh, Bethany he, Wright. Well, and, and also, watching him focus, because he would sort of say before they focus, you know, that before the they were going to do shots. If you just want to make sure everybody knew why we were there, what they were doing, because you could tell that there was money writing on it. That was probably his and his friends and different things. And so he give he he was very leadership oriented. Okay, everybody, thank you for all your hard work. This is what I want to do in the next couple of hours, and we really can't do it if we're all just you know on our game and blah blah blah. Even if you don't have a line, just sit and breathe and watch. Like he he was very global, you know, comprehensive in his, in his way of working. I never, I never thought of him as like, God, that's the luckiest guy in the world. He, he really worked hard. That was, uh, that was amazing. Oh, and then I had said something to him about Stradish because I'm Jewish and going to the Seder. Mm-hmm. And one day on lunch, he motioned me over and he had a little Tupperware thing of kimchi that was, you know, unbearably hot. And he's like, I'll, I'll see your horseradish and raise you my kimchi. <laughs> I shared this <laughs> kimchi with him, and it was, you know, and uh, I said, really, you, you eat this electively? You really, uh, you choose to eat this? Oh, uh, oh you know, I think of my family when I eat this. So it was very funny, but <laughs> it was, it was nice. You know, he would, he would think of you, you know, he would, uh, if, if things would stay in his head, and he would, uh, he'd act on it, which is very nice, you know, that, that's when yeah. you go away saying, no, he, the guy wasn't like some, you know, out of touch star. He was very nice. Nice. Uh, so, who's uh, Bethany Wright. She was beautiful. My God, I, I just, you know, and she, I know she hung around with Joey more, and I think they, they might have known their six degrees. I had no six degrees with her. Plus, you know, I was just out of control crazy, too, so she probably stayed away from <laughs> But uh, uh, she... I saw her do some of the more, you know, quiet scenes and this and that. And now what I know now, she was fine on camera and prepared and, and, uh, you know, would, you know, you always, I mean, yeah, you always laugh at the stars jokes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But she did it well. She did that really well. Played along. Yeah. I was trying to locate her. I, I couldn't look for, I couldn't look for her. Um, David Mendelhall. He was, Cool. David is the boy. His yep. dad was a friend of the director, John John Mendenhall. And shortly after the movie, he uh, I think he passed away. And I was sorry for David because he was just that age, you know. You don't yeah. want some of the kids to go through that. And 
but David was great, always very, you know, bright. How are you guys doing? You know, and, and we'd ask him about school, which confused him. Like, why would anyone want to know about school? And, uh, but he, another one, he, I think he, you know, going back to community theater and stuff, mm-hmm. he had a propensity for learning lines really well and being comfortable around performing adults. And uh, that was cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, J. David Moeller. J. David Moeller, who plays Slim. Oh yeah, not not much memory of that. Yeah, I don't think I, I don't think we interacted much. Hmm. Something tells me that around the time his arc was happening, we were writing other stuff. We were sitting like in the hotel, coming up with something for Johnny. I just remember it that way. Like I didn't. I got to spend time with, like, Robert Keogh, but not Pat Paulson. That whole, he was there, they, I mean, he was in and out, and they, they had some fee for him, and he came in and did it, like, for hire. And yeah. I never got to meet him, because we were stuck in the hotel coming up with something else. So it was an interesting double life, mm-hmm. you know. Um, nope, never, I, don't, I can't say a thing about him. Uh, uh, what else? Joey Travolta? Yeah, that was, we were... We were roommates on, like, big double suite that Jim got and stuff like that. So, mm-hmm. uh, and we found we found ways to party and be stupid, and we had, like, one company car for a bunch of us. And there was, God, what was the name of that place? There was a kind of Houston-type, sort of not quite stripper bar, but, like, women were go-go dancers, but they were clothed. What the hell was the name of that place? And um, we go there and this and that. And people, people recognize, they didn't always know his name, but they're like, You're, aren't you? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, and he had stories, and I love people that have stories. And, and plus, do you remember Dick Sean? Yep. He's married to Wendy Sean, yep. his daughter. So he'd tell me all kinds of Dick Sean stories, because that's one of my idols from, you know, the whole thing from pre- and all the other stuff and Mad Mad World and things so that was cool so <laughs> I really really love spending time with him talking about stuff like that and he, he wrote small things got things done and between those two things and then just hearing the the Travolta royalty stories you know of who did, you know who did what first and uh, it was cool it was, he was it was the best probably the best experience for me as a whole bunch nice uh, we, we did stay in touch over a period of like 10 years, and then we haven't anymore. I don't even know what he's doing, but I, I hope he's doing stuff he likes. I don't know. Yeah. What about the, that girl, uh, Dana, Dana Conlon? Mm-hmm. I don't even know. What, what'd she do in the movie? She's the female nag? Yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think I connected with her much. Um, it was mostly Joey and... And then my writer friends, we had a couple of things, like we tried to get a nag here, and it didn't really work, and it was, uh, she, there was no, uh, I've, it's almost like being, having someone right next to you, you can't really see their face, but if you're walking or sitting at a restaurant right next to someone, you don't have the best experience, you know, you know, you don't have a, a an applicable experience with them. Yeah. So, I don't know, can't remember. What about the, the guy who played McLean, Lee Holmes? He was cool. He was, yeah, I, that was like, I like those kind of guys, the character main guy. I mean, again, I I'm pretty much focused on reacting to everything he said because he was by nature kind of more of a, like a, a guy you'd expect to be a stunt coordinator or that he was a big Vietnam vet with big stories and stuff like that. And yeah. so the position all of us were in, I would, when I think of it now, it's like, what an idiot. But, you know, you'd listen very, with your, with your brow knit, very much listening to what he's saying, and then just go and say, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, like, the dumbest one with the most energy. And, yeah. uh, and he would. He would slap his forehead sometimes, because we'd just improv some of the reactions to him, and he'd like, what are you doing? You know, that kind of deal. But it was, it was never bad. It was just, uh, if, if you've ever done, like, a, a kind of a, ensemble comedy with people, you just automatically have that face slapping thing when the when the nut goes crazy, you know, that it's, yeah. uh, everybody starts playing their parts in that whole story. 
Yeah. I never saw him in anything else. That's I was I was I've always been curious about him. Uh. Uh-uh. Yeah. No. No. Of all these things you're saying, I'm I'm gonna try to reach out to Joey. I've got some eight one eight number for him in L.A. And if I find him, I'll see talk to you because he would he'd have good. I mean, he's at least from then he had a really good memory for stuff, and I'd love to know what he's doing. But I'll tell him I talked with you, and maybe he'll have a sequel to this. Oh yeah, that would be great. I'd love to talk to him. Uh, what else? Uh, the old, else is in the, thing? The, the guy who played Mr. B, uh, Carl Benson. I I know that I had he had a lot of theater stories, and I sort of sat at his knee for a bunch of the things like that. But mm-hmm. that was it. I never uh, never really had any more relationship with him. But I can I do and have always gravitated to the older character guys. Yeah. They have fantastic stories, and when they're interestingly, I, I, this is a there's a lot of holes in this theory, but it still holds some water. Theater stories usually always end well because of the tenacity of whatever who forgot what on stage, or there was a fire in the theater, or scenery fell down, or you know the checks didn't clear, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. They're always about well, here's what we did. Film sometimes is the opposite. Who got fired? Who? argued with who, who, you know what I mean? There, yeah. There's always a, there's just a different, and I think it's because you rehearse for a very long time for theater, and then you're, the company is stuck together for eight shows a week, and with film, it's a lot of journeyman mentality, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So Absolutely. you don't have that all for one, which is, you know, the friggin', you know, the, the, the credo of actors' equity, all for one and one for all. But it makes sense to me. And so I kind of like it when, no, you know, because I, I did a whole slew of commercials for years. That was kind of my main thing after I got done. Just, you know, I didn't really pursue film that much. Or if I got, you know, some out of the blue call, I'd do it. But I wasn't really pursuing it. I was starting to direct and compose and produce and do the things I do now. And when. And I still, though, had this loving soft spot for the way that theater works because it's a positive experience that has a lot of enduring, you know, enduring qualities to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was, I remember there, there was a, Sly, a sliced alone impersonator at the fight, and he was a stuntman named Jim uh, Grumbine. And before, before the fight, you do Burgess Meredith. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I want you to eat lightning and crap thunder, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Oh, and then, and then I think I patted him on the shoulder and did like a comedy thing. And uh, and again, if, if you're around Johnny, then you're, it's coming back. I I do it, and then we go back to one, and I look at him, and I'm like, "Is that okay?" <laughs> he would go, he'd go, "Where do you get this stuff?" You know, it was funny. It wasn't quite praise. It was just like, "Okay." Yeah. You know, and like, and you're gonna do it again, right? And I'm like, "Yep." So he was kind of like the benevolent father that doesn't go crazy, you know, he doesn't scream and yell when you're screaming yelling. It was very cool. Oh, yeah, I haven't thought about that in a while. I don't think he's like, he crap thunder. What a concept. Yeah. What, this, I wonder what ever happened to Johnny Yoon. I was going to ask you. I don't know. I just don't know. I mean, uh, you know, again, my in my bent imagination, uh, you know, he grew up to be Kim Jong. You know, he's like he just had a meeting with Trump. You know, like I don't know, he he probably would show up someplace. Uh, I wonder as well. I hope he's alive and well and happy because he, you know, look at he gave us work. You know, he he provided a lot for everybody. So that was that was lovely. Mm-hmm. Um, again, and if I find out, I'll tell you because it's nice that you're carrying this torch of of this movie that was part of your uh, what formative years. Yep. It's very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you. I don't know. That's very nice. Did you ever see a review about the guy that gave things how many, like, instead of five years, it was five years? Did you see that review? No. He would do it, a PBR, like Paps Blue Ribbon, and I cannot find it. It used to be on the Internet. I'd show friends because it was the worst review of a movie ever, and this guy... It was probably his greatest moment as a, you know, couch critic. Right. And and he focused the review on how bad I was. 
like he said, normally I give, and I'm just completely paraphrasing, normally I give things maybe a four beer thing or a, you know, maybe five beers if it's really terrible. I'm giving this movie 137 beers. It's one of those kind of reviews, you know? Mm -hmm. And you're just chuckling, loving it while you're reading this kind of thing. And then he would say, and the worst part of the movie was this god-awful, and then he... I think he even spelled my name wrong. I don't even know. But it was just Daniel Niden, the worst actor in the blah, blah, blah. And he made me want to gouge my eyes out with rusty spoons. You know, just kept going on and on and everything. Oh, and my God. I, I don't know how to... You can, since you are a performer, too, you can understand. Like, just like when people read their own, you know, mean tweets and stuff. Yeah. It was this badge of honor. I loved it. I was... Uh, I reveled in showing that to friends, like, okay, what do you got? You know, <laughs> like, nothing this bad. That's fantastic. So it was cool. Did you guys... Go on. I you... tried to look for it. When you contacted me, I was going to see if you had seen it, <laughs> send it to you so you could read some of it, whatever. But uh, I cannot find it. I don't know what the guy had been was, but it was two new movies by PBR, or, you know, I gave it three beers. Oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. Isn't that cool? Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Did, did you guys have a Did you guys have a big rap party? No, we. The one biggest thing was probably this kind of Sunday brunch deal where it was a long table and everybody and it was just it was almost for no reason. Everybody they just thought we needed it, or they maybe we wanted it or something like that. And I don't even know who paid for it, but there was you know some toasts and it was when the company was mostly together. The the cameos came and went, so they weren't part of it. The Pat Paulson and Robert Guillaume, but uh, uh, yeah, it was it was a, just a nice. A nice thing. Everybody got dressed up nice, and, and uh, yeah, there was a lot of gratitude. It was really cool. Yeah, it looks like not a, much. Go ahead. What? It, it looks like it looks like a movie where like everybody genuinely liked each other and got along. Absolutely, absolutely. There was nobody. Plus, there's a kid around, so he's you know you get off on you know making half embarrassing things like your girlfriend, you know stupid things like that. So there's a kid to pick on in the best sense of that word, and <laughs> and. You know, you have a star, so the star gets the last word on everything. Like, you know, Johnny would hold forth. You know, so the, I always love the process, whatever it is. If there's a process in play, everybody knows it. They can abide by it. And, yeah, you're right. Then if, you know, if the head is healthy, like, what's that phrase? If the fish stinks, look to the head. And it wasn't. Johnny was a very healthy head guy. And, uh, you know, because anybody, we all have freelance, you know, freelance nightmares and you look at this guy going well he does not work on this nobody works on it he's pushing this rock up a hill by himself so you automatically respect him you know it's nice when that can happen when when there's a definite example being set and everybody follows suit right so how did so how did you form uh your theater company in new york um it's actually unformed now because it was if you mean uh which one are you talking about by the way the one that I um, that I emailed you from the website. The uh, was that DanielMiden.com or something? I don't even know. But there was a website for a while that I, uh, I mean, a, a theater company, mm -hmm. and they've since gone to become something else. And I'm back to doing what I like to do most, which is I write shows with a woman who we've written. Uh, this is sort of our 20th year, she says, of writing together. And almost everything we write is social conscience or we, we laughingly say disease of the week musicals because her <laughs> son had Tourette syndrome growing up and he's, you know, 26 now, but when he was about five, six, seven years old, he, um, he came with this idea after his diagnosis. Um, he walks in the door to his brother who was like the youngest kid they'd ever let in uh, school of visual arts. He's a, kind of a not really known animator right now, but he's a really well respected animator with a company called Titmouse, which is bi coastal. And they do just, you know, all the liquid, uh, the, the adult swim stuff that you see. They do a ton of that. And so he says to his brother, Well, welcome to Terenaville. And he started riffing on Mark Brain, who goes to Mr. Pencil, the principal, and Dr. Sarah Bellum Head, the neurologist. And the kid's five, six years old. And so we pushed him and pushed him to make a story out of it, and then we made it into a musical, and it won this award from the Kennedy Center. We did it from 
Congress back in like 2000. And Dr. John, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's this yep. New Orleans blues guy that's the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And yeah. he recorded one of the songs from it with the Saturday Night Live and all that. And so uh, even back around that time, I was doing that, I was transitioning into composing and directing and producing. And I like it. I, uh, I'm going to revive a show from 85 by those writers that came down to Houston called Nuclear Follies. It's going to be right after Halloween, kind of before the election, and it's a super political thing and all about then the Reagan administration. But like the third song, again, back from 85, the third song is called Evil Russian Guy. Like it's just all come around again. And that always tickles me when stuff just, you know, goes in circles like that. So... I'm doing stuff like that. I've got a um, a musical that I'm about in the eighth year of writing called Bollywood and Vine. It's about <laughs> an old scream queen, someone who, when Tallulah or Betty Davis or Joan Crawford didn't want to scream in their own movies, you know, they were in the sort of later part of their life, wow. uh, like whatever happened to Baby Jane, when they would sort of rear back and put their hands in front of their face and go, you know, but there was no scream. Then Delilah Lee, who, who I'm going to tell you about now, even though she's fictitious, but Delilah Lee would scream for them. Because mm-hmm. they did have scream, understudy screamer kind of people. And uh, she's this really cool character that we keep developing and talking about. And there is a movie called Bollywood and Vine. And so that writer, Edward Jordan, um, he we've all hooked up and he's doing the book for the musical and I don't know if it'll ever really happen because we're take, we're just working as hard as we can on it to try to get it to a regional theater but we did sign a contract with Kathleen Turner to make her musical debut in this musical so nice. it's both very exciting and it's a lot of high pressure and stuff so yeah we'll see what happens nice wow yeah, speaking of Scream Queens, uh, my show here started out as as mostly horror, and now it's I've expanded and gotten all kinds of like cult movie guests and stuff. And yeah, the uh, I was on the phone with John Waters about two months ago because I wanted his endorsement because you know he did Serial Mom and those things, and since he loves Kathleen, right. I wanted him to have some role. Uh, with Bollywood and Vine, there's going to be this movie trailer at the end of it when the whole ending happens and everybody gets what they want. And I wanted him to write and direct the trailer. And so I, I call him to bug him every so often about it, but he's, uh, he's hard to get. Yeah. Wow. That would, That's just, that, that would be great. I'm a huge John Waters fan. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. So let's talk again, but this is really great. Man. Anything else you got other? Oh, uh, do you have any, uh, I, I know you mentioned some plays, but do you have any plays, like, currently that you want to plug? No, well, there's one ending this weekend, so no, I mean, it's, uh, I live in the West Village, and there's, uh, I'm kind of steeped in a lot of, of gay culture. In fact, next week, next summer, next summer is the 50th anniversary of Stonewall, and um, I'm trying to work with some different folks to get a big Stonewall remembrance, because... You know, we're all, it really is just part of our culture of living in the village, and it's not necessarily whether we're gay or not, but it's the essence of human rights and inclusion and stuff. And and I want to I wanna do something at this church that I'm, the play that I have right now that's ending this weekend, that's there. There's, I do a lot of readings and stuff at this one place on Christopher Street, and um and I want to write something for Pride for next year that's kind of a, a riff on the on the Hall of Presidents, mm-hmm. you know, where you have these figures that are kind of, you know, robotic, but they're telling the story of Stonewall. And uh, as it goes on, they can't agree on who threw the first high heel, you know, at a cop, you know, who did this, who did that. And so a fight is actually going to break out with these robot-type people that are, you know, just fabulous at the beginning, but I want to have to just mayhem breaks out and then it kind of spills out onto Christopher Street over to where Stonewall is and then it stops and then they come back and do it again like it rewinds itself. I think it'd be funny. So. Wow, 
that sounds great. Danielle, yeah. I thank you so much for taking the time today, and I, I just want to tell you, I just I appreciate it so much. Yeah, and tell me if you ever get that the VHS of it. I'm glad you're trying to get it. Let me know if you, if you find it. Um, that'd be cool, because I'm, I'm just trying to think if I even know someone who has one, but I will ask around, because uh, you want it, so that's kind of cool. Oh, thank you so much. Can uh, I... So, be well, keep up with the comedy, and... Uh, I don't know if you're ever in New York, but, you know, try to, you know, say and, uh, uh, But let's, yeah, let's do it. Let's stay in touch. And, and if I can, you're, you're kind of uh, motivating me to find Joey, so I'll try to do that and get him to you, okay? <laughs> okay, can, can I add you as a friend on Facebook? Yeah, please. Great, great. Thank you so much, right. and have a great day. Thank you so much. Be well, man. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Daniel Needham. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, Daniel. That was a really cool interview. I, I've always wanted to interview somebody from the movie and was never, never able to until now. Um, if you like this video, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram. And join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past.